Hello, everybody. Welcome. It's uh, top of the hour, so we're going to jump right into things here. Um, my name is Alan Barr. I'm with COEH Northern California. And on behalf of the NIAR supported education and research centers throughout the country, we're pleased to present the 2021 ERC ergonomics webinar series, where we offer free monthly webinars on various topics of human factors and ergonomics. This collaborative effort on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program aspires to provide access to current research supported through NIOSH ERC programs. So thank you very much for joining us today. As a reminder, um, all participants who logged in with their registration email today will receive a link to the recording and an evaluation form, and that will qualify participants for a certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. Some upcoming webinars, uh, August 4th, you can join us for wildfire smoke exposure in kids, how to mitigate health effects. And that will be presented by Stephanie Holm, Dr. Holmes from the University of California, San Francisco. And then and on the 18th of August, you can join us for our next in our ERC ergonomics series titled Musculoskeletal Disorders Among Workers in the Craft Brewing Industry. And that'll be presented by John Rosecrantz and Dr. Rosecrantz is with the Center for Health, Work, and Environment at Colorado School of Public Health. You can register for those and other upcoming webinars at coeh.berkeley.edu forward slash webinars. For today's webinar, you'll be muted during the presentation, but if you'd like to ask a question and we encourage you to do so, please enter it into the online Q&A box. Um, a lot of people will throw it in the chat, but it's much easier for us to manage and track in the Q&A box. If you wouldn't mind, look for that box to submit your questions. And we'll save some time at the end of the presentation to address those questions. And today's webinar will be recorded uh, and made available with past webinars on our COEH Northern California YouTube channel. So I would encourage you to like and subscribe to that channel to help us continue to grow. Thank you for that. Today's webinar, Discovering the Root of Your Backstory, Understanding and Preventing Back Injuries. And this is presented by Dan Neenan and Linda Emanuel, RN, in partnership with the Midwest Center for Occupational Health and Safety. And a little bit about our speakers. Um, Dan joined NICAS staff in August 2002 as director. Dan is a paramedic specialist, a firefighter too, and EMS instructor. He's a member of the Iowa Propane Board, vice chair of the, okay, Dan, you'll have to help me here. How do you pronounce Dubuque. that? Dubuque, I should know that. Yeah. Dubuque County Emergency Management Commission and treasurer, Dubuque County EMS. In his work at NECAS, Dan has developed several OSHA approved training programs, as well as agricultural rescue programs, safety programs include uh, viticulture safety, enology safety, confined space grain bin entry, prevention of grain storage fire and explosions, chemical safety, and confined space manure pit safety. Rescue programs at NECAS include tractor rollover, combine auger rescue, grain bin rescue, and manure pit rescue. That's quite a lot there, Dan. Um, Linda, as I said, is an RN. And good health advocacy has been at the heart of Linda's essence from her formative years as a farm girl in Eastern Nebraska. Graduating from Nebraska Methodist School of Nursing in 1985, she worked as an RN in a variety of acute care hospital settings for over 30 years. She and her husband, Tom, raised three sons on a successful row crop operation that has been able to welcome the next generation and their families home to continue to, to diversify their family business. Linda served as a fellow in the Nebraska LEAD program and has also received agromedicine training at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Linda now serves on the advisory board for CSCASH and is a member of, AgriSafe of the AgriSafe team as a community health nurse. And with those introductions, it's now my pleasure to hand the mic over to Dan and Linda. Thanks for joining us, you guys. Well, uh, good afternoon, folks. I guess it is now afternoon where you're at. It's about uh, two o'clock here in uh, 
downtown Piasta, Iowa. So always a pleasure to present with Linda. Um, we presented several times together and we uh, tend to give each other a hard time. So when she's chatting with you, if you want to ask her what the N stands for in the Nebraska football helmet, I'm sure she'd be glad to answer that for you. So we're going to chat about back injuries today um, and the prevention of back injuries. So we'll go ahead and we will get started. So NECAS is a partnership in safety and health between the National Safety Council and Northeast Iowa Community College. Um, we're part of the Business and Community Solutions Group, and boy, I guess it's been a little bit since we created this program. Uh, our trainings nationwide now, that has grown up to 19, or excuse me, 24 lives saved with our Grain Bend Rescue Program uh, that we've been running. Uh, we also do several other safety programs for business and industry as well. So this is what we're going to chat about today. Um, I, I think that you will hear from Linda as well. Neither one of us want to read the slide to you. We want to try to impart a little bit more information uh, than what is on the slide. So hopefully we won't, uh, we won't uh, fall into that trap for you. So ag is a hazardous industry. So if we take a look at it, um, you know, every year it is right up at the top of the injuries and fatality list, um, you know, and, and that's not the place, of course, that we want to be, um, you know, so as, as you take a look at that, um, you know, construction had the highest number of fatalities, but if you take a look by uh, 100,000 full-time equivalent employees, then uh, ag forestry, fishing and hunting uh, moves to the top of the list. So, as we take a look at this, you know, with women in agriculture, there's nearly 300,000 women that serve as principal operators on over 62 million acres of land, accounting for almost $13 billion in agricultural products that are sold. And I don't think a lot of people understand uh, that there are that many women that are involved in production ag. So, you know, we need to take a look at, um, you know, those things that are unique to women. Um, you know, and, and back injury is no difference uh, to be able to do that. And take a look at what the OSHA standards and the ag exemption uh, that goes along with the family farm. So here is that ag exemption. So farming operations, farming operations uh, is exempt from all OSHA activities, you know, if it employs fewer than 10 employees. Now remember, family members, so farmer, spouse, son, daughter, aunt, uncle, grandma, grandpa, any blood relative does not count towards that 10. It has not had an active temporary labor camp in the past 12 months. So in a court of law, you know, um, OSHA rules and regulations, you know, can prosecute for unsafe conditions. And if there's no other standard that applies, especially in ag, typically it's the general duty clause that is frequently referenced uh, if it gets to that point. Now, even if your farm is not a family farm, okay? You know, the OSHA rules apply. If it is a family farm, I wanna to talk to you about best practices and best practices are going to look very much similar to what the OSHA rules are to be working with. So here we have the general duty clause. You know, we need to uh, furnish our employees a place of employment free from recognized hazards or to take a look at what we can do to mitigate what those are. And again, the general duty clause is used to cite employers for recognized hazards if there's not a direct standard, okay? Um, so if there's no standard that applies to the agriculture operation, typically OSHA could utilize the general duty clause um, if they were going to find an employer. There are some states, currently there's 22 state plans covering both private sector and state and local government workers and six state plans covering only state and local government workers. So if you are identified as one of those states, um, those laws may supersede federal OSHA law. So you need to take a look at what your state plan has out there, as well as what the federal OSHA is working with. Okay. So you must comply with the state requirements, uh, which may be different than what the federal rules are. And employers in the state plan states should contact their state OSHA office to get what those changes or differences may be. So back pain, nearly 80% of Americans experience back pain at some point in time. And you can take a look down through job classifications to be able to figure out, you know, um, as was mentioned at the start, I am a paramedic. 
And uh, a lot of paramedics sometime in their career will suffer a back injury um, from leaning over to pick up a patient from what might not be the best position to be able to do that. So back pain is the second most common lost work time behind the common cold. And men and women alike are prone to work-related back pain with the first episode generally sometime between 20 and 40. So I guess I've been lucky. I've made it past that stage and, and have not had uh, any type of back injury at this point in time. So frequency and economic impact of back injuries and disorders are expected to increase over the next several decades. The other thing to remember is once you've had that first back injury, you become more prone um, to have chronic back pain or to have another lost time work injury because of a back injury. The other thing to remember is that uh, musculoskeletal pain is associated with higher levels of depression symptoms among ag workers. So, you know, we also need to take a look at that as we're working through some of the pain issues. So Linda's gonna take over here and chat for a couple minutes. Thank you, Dan. Coming through okay? You bet. Awesome. Thank you, Dan, for that lead in for back pain. And, and yes, I'd love to talk to any one of you about what that N stands for on our Nebraska helmets, as well as the other great sports we have here in Nebraska. So um, as Ellen had led us into, I am a registered nurse and I worked acute care for a number of years. And I saw a lot of patients come in in my small rural hospital um, with debilitating back injuries. And, and we're going to dig into the why. In the causes of back pain and injury in agriculture, on the next slide there, Dan, um, there you go. Um, the physical condition, we know that in agriculture, it is physically grueling work. And, and I can speak well to that. I grew up on a farm and continued to help my um, farm family. We were row crop farmers here in Eastern Nebraska with their work. And we also tend to a small cow calf herd operation. And, and handling livestock is one of those um, causes of back pain. Livestock are unpredictable and crushing and or stricken injuries happen easily as we're working with them. Um, there's long working hours when it comes to agriculture and those muscles can become very fatigued and tired and and that's not only um, physical fatigue it's mental and spiritual fatigue as well and it, as those muscles fatigue it puts more pain and um, strain on those joints which then makes us more susceptible to injury. And we also know that when we're tired, it affects our balance. And so those trunk muscles that help us stand up straight to help us carry that body weight along with carrying those extra loads um, is all affected. And, and the list is of the causes of back pain and injury are all listed there in front of you. And, and it's for women over 60 years of age, kind of a special to note that slips, trips, and falls are primary factor relating to their back pain. In the next slide, the perceived causes of back pain, the University of Nebraska Medical Center had done a study back in 2016 of Midwestern farmers over the age of 19 and 55.2% reported that they believed their back pain was farm work related and that primary cause of back pain is lifting, followed by twisting. Often we're caught in awkward positioning as we're lifting animals over gate, especially those baby animals over fences and we're twisting in awkward positions as well as working under hoods of the implements and the tractors combines that we have to have to help us do our work. Um, the repetitive motion as well as standing in long periods of time as they're working on um, different tools within their shop and, and the work that, of the tasks that need to be done. We talk about the physical factors, the BMI, our body mass index, that impacts our balance. Many of our mothers and fathers probably told us to stand up straight and how important that was. And it wasn't only for aesthetic value. It also helps in us carrying our weight. So if you figure, think about a plumb line that goes through the top of your head, that is that line of gravity then that goes through the jaw, the front of the shoulder joints, through or behind the hip joints and the front of the knee as you're straightening up that spine and, and you're accommodating those, those three curves, those normal curves. That is what our body is designed to do to carry our weight. And that is what is important to keep as we go down to pick and lift and to move objects. For some folks that are obese, that line of gravity then shifts forward. And, and what happens there is it causes all those posterior muscles to work harder as they're trying to maintain that line of balance. And those contributing factors to injury, we have physiological and social factors. Many farmers are working alone. 
We work long hours, well into the evening, well into the night. And many times the work that has to be done is dependent on weather or specific timelines. And so that, that forces us to let go of those good habits because we are so driven to get the work done. The average age of the farmer is 57 to 58 years of age. So we're not getting younger. And of course, as we age, our body changes and deteriorates in, in specific areas. We lose our peripheral vision and that visual acuity is so important when we're lifting and moving objects. Um, females, for us females, working, we're working well past the age of menopause. And what, through menopause, we lose that estrogen that we so need to help support good bone health. And so I can't stress enough for females to have phys conversations with their physicians about the appropriate time to have a bone density scan or a DEXA scan. Um, if you have a family history of osteoporosis or osteopenia, important that you have that conversation with your physician early. We also know that smoking contributes to osteoporosis and osteopenia, as well if you've had a previous history of a fracture. And just as a reminder, osteopenia is a condition where the bones are weaker than normal, but you're still able to do those activities of daily living easily. Osteoporosis then is when that bone strength has weakened to the point that you're susceptible to fracture. And it's so important that females realize that bone strength that's critical to meet the demands of our job in agriculture. In ergonomic differences, we have been designed differently than our male counterparts and it puts us at risk for farm injury. On the average, females are shorter than the men. We have more fatty tissue um, in specific areas. Um, females also have narrower shoulders, wider hips, and proportionally have shorter legs and arms. And, and on the average, our strength is 45 to 75% less in males when it comes to our upper body. So our upper body is significantly weaker than the males. And our lower body then is five to 30% less than the males. So, and this is for most people. Um, so important to note, as I say, to capitalize on those areas of your body that have that strength. And that for females is in our glutes and our hips and our thighs. And if I may add and be so bold, our brains and in our hearts. In the symptoms of back injury, those symptoms can vary and it can be a, a short stint. Um, as Dan said, 80% of us will have some sort of back injury between the, starting at the age of 20 to 40. And I am in that category. I had a back injury um, due to some work here on the farm when I was in my 30s. And, and that pain can vary from just short and somewhat mild, somewhat achy to something severe that can be incapacitated, incapacitating. Um, it's the most leading cause of pain for most people and the most reason that people will see a doctor or miss days at work. And um, we know that farmers are so driven to get that work done that we have little regard for the ergonomics and that potential for injury. And for females, we do have a slightly higher percentage of low back pain, um, could be due to our increased risk because multiple pregnancies as well as females have the triple duty stress syndrome. And so for a lot of females that are part of family farms or ranches, we have the work of our home and taking care of our family. We also have the work that needs to be done in, on the farm and the ranch. And for many, many others, we have off farm income coming in to, to give us insurance benefits as well as retirement benefits and a positive cash inflow. And that spinning of those multiple plates in the air for females increases our mental stress as well as our increased risk for ag injuries. And we know that females take um, little time for that dedicated exercise and stretching. So when it comes to the types of back injuries, we look at sprains and strains. Sprains occur when the ligaments, and that's those tissues that attach the bones at the joint become stretched or torn, where strains occur when the muscles or the tendons, and tendons are those tissues that connect muscles to the bone become stretched or torn. And when we think about the spine in the back, the ligaments, those bands of tissue that hold that vertebrae snugly in place, and the tendons are those that attach the muscles to the spinal column. Whereas the nerves, as you look at that schematic drawing, are rooted to the spinal cord and control our body movements. And that's the nerves are what transmit those signals from the brain to the body that allows us to move into function. When we talk about herniated discs, herniations occur when the disc or those cushions that help soften any blows or sudden 
vibrations or jolts to the spine, um, those discs may bulge or rupture. So when that happens, it reduces the cushioning between the bones. It can irritate the nerves, cause that sciatica pain that some folks have. And, and that's that pain that originate, originates in the lower back and radiates down the leg. And, and that is due to an injury to the nerve and irritation, inflammation, or pinching compression of a nerve in your lower back. And, and as we age, remember I said the average age is 57 to 58 years of age, our disc can break down with age and, and that also makes them more susceptible to herniations. When we look at the types of back injuries, fractured vertebrae, we talk a lot about the lumbar spine and, and Dan will move that on to the to the next slide, there you go. The lumbar spine, that is the lower part of the spine. And, and many times when I worked in acute care, we were treating injuries that were from L1 to L5. That's the primary area where I saw a lot of injuries. And, and that part of the spine um, is where we support much of our body weight. So what are some chronic conditions that can contribute to our back pain? And that would be good old arthritis. And arthritis is means joint inflammation. And the joint inflammation is just the symptom or the sign, and it's not really a specific diagnosis. And arthritis is often referred to, um, to any disorders that affect the joints. In our normal healthy joint, we have a juicy fluid movement that we're working with in our muscles, the cartilage, and the tendons that surround the joint. Um, in, Arthritis, and specifically I'm talking rheumatoid arthritis, um, we have a bone loss and a cart cartilage loss that can contribute to our joint inflammation. And that alone, that arthritis can greatly contribute to back pain. So how do we prevent it? What can we do about it? Well, let's talk about the lifting and carrying. Get help when you are lifting the lifting to help lighten the load. And if that means making more trips, that's okay. That's a little bit of more aerobic exercise. We know that there is no replacement for a healthy back. Um, and protecting your back is one of the most important things a producer can do to stay productive and healthy on the farm. Some of those injuries can develop over time. And so trying to, making sure to establish good habits early or any time during your career will help preserve your back health for a lifetime. So when lifting, as I said, get some help, especially if you're lifting things that are oddly shaped or may shift while you're lifting them. Size up that load first, test it before you lift. And it's also helpful to do some stretching, some extra easy exercises, and we'll go into that a little bit deeper in, the, in this presentation. Some exercises and stretches that you can do to help warm up those muscles. Your feet are to be feet are to be shoulder width apart, and to have a solid base of support whenever possible. And it, it may be helpful to put one foot slightly in front of the other as you bend deeply at the knees, drop your rear, and and prepare to lift the object. Um, when you lift that object, be careful that you don't twist. Move your feet instead. Keep those objects close to your body. I like to. Um, refer to as our elbows as like wings, chicken wings, keep those wings snug and close to your, your abdomen. Um, if you have hydraulics and pneumatics to lift those heavy items whenever possible, do that. We encourage you to work smarter and not harder and use equipment to help you move um, items long distance like wheelbarrows and hoists. And um, back braces for some um, folks have been helpful, although I have to share a word of caution that some people can use that back brace as a crutch and not really want to or mindfully engage their core, those core abdominal muscles to protect that back to help with the lifting. Um, the, using a back brace and supportive device is a great conversation to have with your physician. So let's prepare to lift. When you lift, it's always, I said, first of all, to test the load, bend deeply at the knees, engage your core and we all have those abdominal core muscles. It may take a little bit of practice to exactly find, identify where they're at. Take that deep breath in, bend down deep, lift that object, keep your back nice and straight, look straight ahead when you're lifting and then exhale while you stand up. Um, so important with uh, keeping your knees um, um, behind the toes slightly. And as you lift, there'll be some point where those knees will have to move forward over the toes, but that's just briefly. Again, working with your breath and working your, with your abdominal core is so key. 
So preventing back injuries, working with livestock. Again, um, we work with livestock here. We work with cattle. Um, so have assistance. It's always great to have another set of eyes with you when you're working with um, livestock because they're unpredictable. So having someone tell you if you're, become, you're in a flight zone or in some kind of a danger zone. Use feeding equipment and bail handlers. Um, be mindful when you're working with those shorter animals, such as um, hogs or sheep. And um, of course you want to avoid falls from horses. And so um, knowing what the temperament of that animal is that you're working with, as well as excitability is so important. Also in working with livestock, um, using animal handling equipment to restrict that animal movement is helpful. Those are my guys when they, uh, we have, uh, during calving season, we have a calf handler, which has been helpful as they treat young livestock and move them to the barn if they have to. It's also great because they can keep a distance between the mother and that baby calf as they're working with them. Um, some other animal handling equipment are squeeze chutes handling pins, um, automatic squeeze chutes may be helpful to help keep that animal in place while you do your work. Um, we also have race platforms that overlook our chutes when we're giving vaccinations. So that's great to keep that animal, um, again, you have the distance between you and that animal and you um, can potentially avoid um, needle stick injuries. So those shops, um, working in a farm shop, um, farmers and ranchers may be standing in one position for long periods of time. So um, keep your equipment within um, arm's reach. Um, placing anti-fatigue mats on that concrete floor is very helpful when you're standing for long periods of time. Use a stool when you're working close to the ground rather than on bent knees or stooping and um, use long handle tools to increase leverage and, and reduces that need for that awkward stretching. Slips, trips, and falls. One of the um, primary factors when it happens, when it comes to back injuries. Um, so keeping our work area clean and free of clutter, especially tractors, that equipment during harvest season, it gets pretty crazy and chaotic around here. And so I, I do encourage all of our employees to pick up their, their tractor floors, combine floors um, at all times of the day. Um, Maintain three points of contact with climbing. So that means you keep two, going up and down ladders. So that means you keep two feet, one hand, or two hands and one foot as you climb up and down the ladders. Um, when you're climbing in and out of equipment, such as combines or tractors, we encourage you to turn around and face that equipment and descend backwards rather than treating that ladder like a set of stairs. And footwear is so important to wear good footwear. There is no room in my mind for flip flops in agriculture. It's just um, inviting injury as well as you don't have that good support. And um, handing items up and down the ladder to a coworker um, to keep your hands free when you're climbing in and out of that equipment is advisable. So machinery build in women. We know that, especially in older equipment, a lot of this, these tractors and, and equipment was designed for the male's body design and strength. And so this is me on our 1959 Oliver tractor, very older tractor, but it's, it's easy for me to work. And I kind of call it my tractor because I understand it so well. Um, it is a tricycle tractor. However, I do have to pull myself up on the seat forward because that seat does not move. It is a metal seat. Uh, the gear shift to move that transmission along is hard and I strain with my shoulder and my elbow. So I really have to watch my body mechanics in that I keep that 90, 90 um, degree angle, 90 degree bend at the hips, 90 degree angle at my knees and then keep my feet flat. Um, this is the reality in agriculture though. Um, we have various equipment that we work with and, and we know that this tractor does not have a rollover protection structure. I am searching different dealerships to find one. It's not easy. Um, and so it's important that you're aware of the safety factors on your tractor. The next tractor that um, I get to use on our farm is, is newer. Um, it's got a larger horsepower. Um, the transmission is easier for me to work because it's all hand controls. Um, with that given, I can also move that seat forward and back. It's got an anti-vibration seat, so it helps absorb those rough bumps that I have to travel over in my equipment. The steering wheel moves forward and back, so I can adjust it to meet my needs. Um, 
while the physical part the inside the cabin of this tractor is designed to accommodate me, what I have to be mindful of is all of the data that's coming out to me. So there's four monitors there that I'm keeping track of as we harvest our grain. Um, it does have mirrors and a camera so that I can see behind me without having to twist my shoulder and my spine to keep looking at the, the gravity wagon behind. Um, and so th there's just a difference in tractors and a different in equipment. And so it's important that you're mindfully aware of your equipment. And it's good, even though this tractor is, is easier to work, it's more comfortable, so important that I get out of that tractor once every hour to an hour and a half and do a walk around to check the equipment as well as to stretch. And Dan, this is your lead into whole body vibration. So there needs to be a lot more studies done on whole body vibration. Um, as you can see here, ag workers have been found to exceed the European Union recommended daily allowance. However, OSHA does not enforce a whole body vibration standard, and it, it poses a substantial risk for folks for spinal musculoskeletal disorders. And ag is a place where you're going to get a whole lot of whole body vibration. Okay, so the University of Iowa has done some studies. Vibration can also be transferred to the operator through the feet, the backrest, the handlebars, or hand controls with that. And of the 112 machines observed, about 35% of them were manufactured after 2000. So therefore about 65% of them were manufactured before 2000 and about 15% of them were built before 1969. So, you know, we take a look at this, uh, a lot of these older pieces of equipment are still in service on a regular basis. So, you know, the action level is the level above which the risk for health effects increases. Um, you know, so within eight hours of continuous use with ATVs, uh, heavy utility vehicles and tractors are most likely to reach the European Union recommended daily action level with that. And, you know, you've got noise, you've got vibration uh, that's going on there. All these things can have a more long-term effect on the farmer body. So the person's daily dose of vibration depends on the magnitude of the vibration and of course the exposure. So it's always good, you know, if you can to rotate out which piece of equipment that you're using, um, you know, and to limit the amount of time on each of those, you know, to figure out what that daily dose might become. So, you know, this is courtesy of the University of Iowa and the Great Plains Center. Um, you know, taking a look at some of the health effects, things that can cause issues there, you know, and you take a look at more long-term, you know, uh, or um, what could be more trauma related is the disruption of balance and disruption of perception that are there. Muscle fatigues, cramping, speech interference, increased heart rate, and blood pressure. So we found as we've gone out and done a lot of different uh, screenings for folks at farm shows, a lot of folks have some atrial fibrillation going on uh, or, you know, not a regular heartbeat. So when you're increasing that and your blood pressure, you know, we can have some, some issues that are, are brought forward with the whole body vibration. Well, as a person sits, the curvature of the lower back is typically lost without lumbar support. Um, as I say, as I say that I'm sitting here and I'm leaning forward um, in my chair to, to get a little better view of the computer screen. You know, you combine that with the whole body vibration, there's repeated stretching of the lower back, which is one possibility for how long, prolonged exposure to the whole body vibration can lead to, you know, more long-term health problems. So seats on equipment have come a long way, you know, since the one that was pictured there that I think Linda was chatting about. If the operator feels the seat bottom out or slam down on the base plate, that seat's not working properly and it's not properly adjusted for the operator's weight or there's a failure in the mechanism. This is especially important if several workers or family members are operating that piece of equipment. Seat suspension systems can degrade over time from mechanical wear and tear. The seat components may need periodic replacement to be able to provide you with that safety that was there when that was new. So other considerations that can help reduce the whole body vibration is to keep the tires properly inflated. A lot of people won't check that inflation unless they see that the tire looks low, then they may check that. Um, maintain vehicle suspension, um, using different tractors and machinery for different tasks. 
and reduce the vehicle speed over rough, rough terrain with getting bounced through there. Skidders are, uh, skid steers are, you know, prominent in that when you get going over bumps that it, it will keep rocking that machine, you know, until you can get it stopped and reset. Uh, and rotate your workers to, uh, you know, between tasks to limit that exposure, get them in and out and avoid physically demanding activities for a short time after exiting the machinery to allow the back to recover just a little bit. I don't think in ag people take sufficient breaks to be able to do that. Um, you know, we talk about that a lot during National Farm Safety and Health Week, especially if you take medication that is food dependent. A lot of times we get into trouble um, because we don't take the time to eat. Uh, we do take our medicine, uh, but we don't take the time to eat. And if our medicine is food dependent, that can cause issues for us again. So there's a lot of resources that are out there. Um, here's one from the Great Plains Center at the University of Iowa. And you can see down on there, you know, they have uh, Facebook and Twitter and a website uh, that you can go to and you can download this, um, you know, to be able to print that out and keep it with your equipment for some employees. We need to take a look at doing education. So education like what we're doing here, um, including general principles of ergonomics. So I've talked about it and Linda has talked about, we seem to lift things when we're not in the correct position to be able to do that. And that's kind of a, a recommended normal uh, or a normalcy, maybe not recommended, but it's a normalcy that we see in ag and some other, um, you know, type jobs. So we need to know what those hazards are, how these injuries are occurring, and then work to make sure that we don't put ourselves or our employees into that position. So taking care of that, and actually this is Linda's slide, so I will turn it over to Linda. Thanks, Dan. So when we talk about the treatment of back pain and injuries, take care of that injury, treat it early and don't let it go. And, and these are some methodologies that are conservative and over the counter. Um, rest is important. And when I mean by rest, um, I'm not talking complete bed rest. I'm talking gentle movements and where you rest for a while and then get up and walk um, easily, maybe around your house or around the farm. Um, when it comes to a back injury, there's a potential for the, that cycle of that injury and that um, it hurts to move, so people may stop moving. Um, from there, they develop stiffness and then weakness in the back. So, um, of course, we want you to check with your physician when you have a back injury, but um, it's important that you don't consider complete bed rest. Um, frozen rice bags may work for the ice and um, as a frozen um, frozen substance because that those rice bags can fit into those special little nooks and crannies in your back. And so maybe a rotation of 20 minutes of ice and then 20 minutes off or uh, some type of a moist heat for 20 minutes on and 20 minutes off. Um, Anti-inflammatories such as non-steroidal non -steroidal anti-inflammatory products are maybe advisable reading the labels there on how often, how frequent you can take those as well as acetaminophen and aspirin. Um, some type of topical pain reliefs. And um, we um, do advise some gentle stretching. Again, talk to your healthcare professional before you um, try any of these methodologies and as a last resort, um, surgery. So how do we maintain that back health? Establish those routine activities that protect and strengthen your back, um, strength, strengthening those core muscles that nature's corset to help protect those vertebrae, um, stretching daily, sitting for long periods of time as farmers sometimes do and their equipment can stiffen up those joints and those muscles, um, practice proper posture, especially when you're seated, it's the 90-90 rule. Um, sleeping, make sure that your mattress is firm and um, you have good support there and to maintain that proper spine alignment. Um, it is advisable that folks sleep on their back, um, but for some like me, I'm a side sleeper. So putting a pillow between my knees to support my spine and hips is, is helpful. And it's also important um, to consult with your physician and talk to him about your work when you go in for your screenings. So AgriSafe, with the help of certified Pilates instructor and a certified yoga instructor, have downloadable resources, and that would be on your next slide there. Oops, Dan, catching up with me. So the, the posters um, that we have are free, and it's part of our Ready to Farm project. And um, we have some exercises there that we targeted specific muscle groupings. And Dan, you have one more to catch up with me. 
there you are. Um, so as you can see there, um, these um, have been targeted for producers. So these are simple things to do on the farm or um, on your ranch. We also have a YouTube channel if you want um, more complete tutorials on how specifically to do these exercises. I am a, a yogi. I've been practicing for 12, 15 years and it sure has helped me to do the work here on, on our farm. So there's also specific tools. Green Heron is a company that um, with the assistance of USDA funded research um, field tested various tools for specifically the female body. Um, they have the D handles, those green handles on top of their tools there that were developed um, with the female's strength and, and anatomical design in mind. Um, I have a set of these tools. I really like them. They are sized for your height, so they're more appropriate um, to work for the female body. There's also anti-vibration gloves. Um, these gloves are designed to help reduce the strain on the shoulders and the back because it allows me to grip objects easier. Um, they've got a nice Velcro um, tab there at the wrist so I can fit my hand. Um, they've got padded fingertips and binding on the knuckles. So again, when I'm running equipment for long periods, the vibration um, is absorbed somewhat through the gloves rather than through my shoulder and, and elbows wrists there too. So more healthy habits for preventing back injuries. Wear boots with high quality soles. Again, no flip flops. Um, stay well hydrated as well as Dan talked about a good nutrition. Manage your stress. We know that folks that are under heavy emotional and, and spiritual stress um, tend to have tighter, more tense muscles, and those tense muscles um, can set you up for injuries and um, cause you more distress. And, and know your body's limitations. It's okay to ask for help. If there's a heavy object that needs to be lifted, you don't have help around, maybe it can wait till a little bit later in the day. And how do we manage that chronic pain? Well, we can treat it um, with some of those measures I had talked about earlier, those conservative measures as possibly Epsom salt baths. Um, ideally, you want to address your physical, emotional, and cognitive needs um, when it comes to managing cr chronic pain. And these are great conversations to have with your physician or for those of us that ru live rural, nurse practitioners are a great resource. And um, the first step is to seek help from your healthcare provider and don't wait, um, seek that treatment early. So more management items on that chronic pain, um, they're all listed there. And as well as um, watching your alcohol intake, um, we know that pain often dis disrupts sleep and along those lines, alcohol can also cause further disruption of sleep. Um, know your medications, the benefits, as well as the side effects. And if those benefits are being outweighed by the side effect, then it's time to have a conversation with your physician. If you smoke, strongly encourage to seek a quit uh, smoking um, options. And we know that cigarettes can impair healing because they reduce the blood flow to the lower spine. And they have also been identified as a risk factor for degenerative disc disease. Um, and they also may contribute to osteoporosis. There are additional resources out there. One of them is the Agricultural Medica Medicine book by Dr. Kelly Dunham and Anders Thielen, a great reference, um, as well as the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Strokes is, is another a great area to find um, fact sheets. And Dan, to wrap us up. All righty. So, you know, what we're looking at is we want folks to think about this earlier in their career and not just think about back pain after they've had that injury, but how we can get folks pre-injury and to, to prevent that injury from happening. Because again, once you have that first injury, you are prone uh, to having back problems for the rest of your life. And we'd like to get to, to folks and have them start practicing good lifting techniques to make sure that uh, you know, they're not going to have that first injury. So a little boilerplate information here um, under federal law, of course, you are entitled to a safe workplace. Your employer needs to provide a workplace uh, that's free of known healthy. Wow, I'm drinking Diet Pepsi, really, okay? Of known health and safety hazards. And if you have concerns, the right to speak up. So if you are an employer, this is the time to make sure your door is open and you're willing to listen to any of your employees come in with any concern that they have about safety. 
and to be proactive about it. Okay, because if you come in and they want to talk to you about a $15 box of hearing protection and you blow them off and don't give them the time of day, what's the chances they're going to come back to you with a more serious issue? They're not. Okay, so we need to have that open door policy and to be able to have that conversation with them. So you have a right uh, to be trained in a language that you understand. Okay, some folks don't understand English. That's okay. Uh, so a lot of these safety programs are being created in other languages um, that we can work with that. So we're, we're actually working on some programs now that are being translated over into Spanish uh, to be able to help those workers and you know, have an understanding of that. So work on machines that are safe, be provided the safety gear or the PPE, like what Linda had talked about, be protected from toxic chemicals, request an OSHA inspection and speak to the inspector. Um, when we first got this OSHA grant, uh, we went out to DC to OSHA and we had lunch with some of the people that run the hotline. And we asked them how many folks had a conversation with their employer before they called in to the OSHA hotline. And they said they asked that. And the surprising thing is not a lot of people feel that they can go and talk to their employer about that. So that's something that I think we need a lot of work with in working with employers and employee relationships. There is the whistleblower protection program that's out there and there is a website that you can go to to know what your rights are that if you're going to file a complaint um, you know that it protects you from retaliation um, you know on the job and again like Linda talked about there's a lot of resources that are out there the OSHA webpage um, you know you take a look at you know the centers the NIOSH centers that are um, helping us do this webinar today um, I, I saw that uh, Renee Anthony from the University of Iowa is on today. You know, we're, we're quoting a lot of their research, uh, you know, as we work with this. So remember that there's a lot of materials that are out there. Don't forget about, you know, your doctors, your nurses, and your other healthcare providers, um, you know, to talk to them. If you're having issues, like Linda talked about, reach out early um, to be able to do it. Don't wait until it becomes a chronic issue. And like anything, uh, this material is produced under a Susan Harwood training grant, and it does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, we didn't mention any trade names, commercial products. We're not here to sell you anything. We're here to talk about concepts, okay? And here is the contact information that you can reach out uh, to me, and I believe Linda will provide you her contact information to be able to do that. So we worked out pretty well. We wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions and answers, and I believe we've accomplished that. So I will turn it back over. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Linda. Yes, um, that's great. Let's, uh, we do have a couple of questions, but uh, there's actually some commentary more so, I think, coming back and a little bit of pushback on the use of recommendation, although you did deliver it with caveat, um, the recommendation of using back belts. Um, there's a, quite a bit of NIOSH uh, CDC literature um, sort of counter contraindicating that. So um, do you want you might, do you want to speak to that at all? Or um, it's really just a comment from, um, well, from a couple of people actually, so. I, I do appreciate that um, information. And yes, that's why I shared that caveat. Um, you're right. Um, there is literature out there that um, is controversial to that. So we are always open to know, to learning what's new. And so I appreciate um, that attendee's comment. Great, and if anyone else would like some more information on that, you can uh, do a quick Google search into uh, CDC or NIOSH. Um, they had a working group formed in the 90s about back belts, and there's a lot, of, a lot of reading you can do on that if you'd like to know more. And the other um, one that was sort of shared commentary again was simply um, uh, re in regard to stretching and the efficacy of stretching and injury prevention. Um, one specific question was um, when stretch when you mentioned you mentioned stretching of the lower back. Uh, do you advise stretching prior to doing ag work? Um, so there's some debate in uh, stretching prior to physical activity where it could be attributed to risk of injury. Are you familiar with that? Um, I, I read that chat and um, the literature that I just, I was doing some research this morning and, and for most sites, it does encourage some simple stretching, but to do it safely. 
right? You have to know what you're stretching and, and why you're stretching and, and to do it routinely, not just, okay, today I'm going to stretch quick before I lift something. So um, I, I, there is some controversial information out there. Um, the information that we build our presentations on, though, um, is evidence-based and usually comes um, from the CDC or, or the National Institutes of Health. Great. And uh, the first question I got, uh, it was popped in the Q&A was um, whether or not you're able to quantify a percentage of back injuries that were attributable to whole body vibration exposure. And then somebody posted in the chat a resource to, at the University of Iowa um, that deals with um, whole body vibration resources. So perhaps those questions could be answered via that link. So I, I point the questioner uh, to that link in the chat. Um, uh, unless you guys have any specific numbers you could share with us now. I, I don't do. have anything specifically. Um, I, I think uh, Renee at the University of Iowa, I think is the one who published that. Um, I think that they're doing a lot of the research on that topic and that would be a great place to go and take a look. Great, and do you encourage Linda warmups prior to stretching? To get the, you know, to get that circulation pumping, to, to get that blood flow versus going from like we call them, like the cold calls, you know, type syndrome where you just jump into something. Um, I do encourage, you know, whether it's a brisk walk or um, just a, a simple, gentle stretch of the back and, and refer back to those um, yoga posters that we put together. Uh, they have some simple stretching that you can do. So it, it is good to warm up those muscles, especially in the wintertime when our muscles tend to become more cold and tight. Great. Hey, Dan, I have a question for you. Um, do you know if the uh, rotate workers advice is widely accepted given that it seems to be to me to be relatively less expensive than some of the other interventions like equipment ch changes or things like that? Do, do, you, do you happen to know how, how widely accepted that worker rotation is? You know, to be honest with you, I, I don't have percentages in my mind, but I do know that uh, a lot of people tend to like certain tasks and they gravitate toward that task and may not want to give it up. Um, so it may have to be something that the employer would, you know, set out uh, kind of a rostered schedule to be able to do that, um, just to rotate people through. Sure. Uh, and Linda, um, do you, I, I really love the idea of the exercise uh, to increase circulation and tissue health um, and the ag uh, exercise programs. Do you see that being implemented uh, widely or, or sparsely? Or, I mean, I, I know that, you know, working a physical job, um, it's, it's hard work, it's tiring. Um, you're not, the, the first thought is probably not to exercise, uh, you know, before or after a long day mm -hmm. uh, on the farm. I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. So, it, it, you know, sometimes um, experience is the best teacher. And in my conversations and with farmers, um, if they've had an injury, it becomes more apparent to them the need to take care of their body. And so then they're more apt to do that stretching because it hurts and they don't want to have that pain happen to them again, where they're pulled out of action. And, and so we'd love to switch that pendulum just a little bit and that get these farmers and ranchers into a routine of mindfully walking. We know that they're physically active in their work. You know, they, their days are long and they're busy, but to give themselves 15, 20 minutes, either at the top of the day or maybe at the end of their day, um, be better, of course, if they could do it at the beginning of the day to warm those muscles up, but um, to do it routinely as a preventative measure versus because they've got an injury and now they have to treat something. We got you, thank you. Dan, um, I'm curious as to uh, so where this OSHA exemption sort of came from and do you think if that was um, overturned that it would significantly impact the incidence of injury on the farm if that if that definition was changed? The one you um, first actually mentioned. if you take a look when Congress first created OSHA it's on the very front page that uh, OSHA will enact no law or enforce no law on the family farm. Um, I you know it would take a lot in my mind to overturn that. Um, I 
myself, um, when I go out and teach, um, I, I don't try to say that that is the idea. I would like to work within the laws that are there, um, you know, to be able to do that. Um, you know, I think there'd be a lot of pushback to try to change that, um, you know, and as far as that goes, so, you know, we're here to teach what we can. Uh, it's not our job to work to change the law, I guess, is the way that I view that. And I know that I seem like I'm sidestepping that question, but um, again, I don't, I want farmers to come to the safety presentation. And if I'm one advocating for change and putting more restrictions on there, they might not want to talk to me about what I feel about safety. So I would much rather have a simple conversation with folks and, and see if I can't talk to them about safe practices as opposed to regulating them. Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a fair stance. Um, so I, we're sort of running out of questions here. Uh, so I think we're getting close to the wrap up. Um, there is one uh, piece of advice on your older tractor, uh, Linda. <laughs> I consider, saw that. <laughs> a pad, I thought I, that was an excellent idea. I like it. I do. I think that's a great idea to, yeah. to put a seat pad on there to, to fix that somehow onto that tractor. So thank you. Absolutely. That's a great looking tractor, by the way. Well, thank uh, you guys thank so you. much. I'll just, uh, if you, when I, when we wrap this up, it will end the um, webinar for all of us. So if you have any closing remarks you'd like to make, you're welcome to do so. Otherwise I will, um, um, throw in a couple of housekeeping remarks. I appreciate folks' time today. And, and as always, um, they're certainly welcome to reach out to us at AgriSafe, and, and we can be found um, through your web browser at agrisafe.org. And my email address, if folks so wish to directly connect with me, is L Emanuel, that's E M A N U E L, at agrisafe.org. Oh, thank you so much for that. I really I've really seen the question pop up twice about whether we would offer this in Spanish. I, I know that we're working on several of the programs that we've created. Um, and I know I just scheduled this morning uh, taking our HASCOM program and, and translating that into Spanish. I guess I do not know today um, when this particular one would be scheduled to be translated into Spanish, but I do believe it's on the agenda to make that happen. Oh, that's great, Dan. Thank you for that too. I, I, I apologize um, for missing that question. I, 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 or should I say, I saw the question, but I, I thought it was perhaps in, with respect to our webinar series in general and perhaps not directed to you, but I think you might be right. I just, uh, my self-centric uh, perspective. Um, so thanks for that. And uh, if um, Juan Antonio would like to reach out to COEH to find out more about um, our Spanish offerings, you're welcome to do that as well. COEH at berkeley.edu. Um, okay, well, thank you very much. So um, attendees, you can learn more and register for upcoming events at coeh.berkeley.edu. Um, you can reach us through the website if you have any further questions and we can also forward them on to Dan and Linda. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find recordings of previous webinars and other events, um, and I encourage you to do so. And just as a reminder, everyone who, that logged in today with your registration email, you'll receive a link to the evaluation form that will qualify you for a certificate of completion worth one CE contact hour. So a big thank you to our um, speakers today, and I look forward to seeing everybody at the next webinar. Have a great day. Talk to you later.